want to thank uh, you all for inviting us here. We've really had a, a, a wonderful, wonderful visit. Uh, it's been a pleasure to meet so many of you informally. Our dinner last night was, was an incredible pleasure for us. Uh, the lunches, the, the many sort of informal gatherings. So we, we, we've really been uh, loving this, this, this visit and uh, we, we are very, very grateful to you. So uh, uh, let me begin by putting this picture up. I look for my childhood self in two tattered photos from the early years of my family's refuge in La Paz, Bolivia, and I see a somber-looking boy in the midst of an unsmiling children and adults. The two photographs have my father's captions on the back, written in German. Schule, school, Miraflores, which is a section of La Paz, 1944. The second one says, Poldi, that's my nickname. <laughs> Fünf Jahre, five years old, kindergarten. Both, as you can see, were taken outdoors, most probably on the same day, in a stone-paved yard in front of a weather-beaten, discolored, whitewashed adobe wall with a scattering of houses and a heavy sort of cloud-covered Altiplano mountain plateau, 14,000 feet high, visible in the background. The building where our family lived in an apartment overlooking the school is in the background. The photo depicting the larger assemblage, the top photo, shows all of the day students and teachers in the Kinderheim. The children's home that was sponsored for Jewish refugee children in La Paz, Bolivia, by the American Joint Distribution Committee in New York. The other photo, the one below, shows only my kindergarten class, our teachers and their aides, as well as some two dozen preschool infants who attended the institution during their parents' working hours. The majority of us in the kindergarten class, as well as our teachers, are wearing white apron coats, as you can see, which are the requisite uniform in Bolivian schools at the time, Unlike those of more other uh, elite institutions, however, our uniforms bear no identifying school insignia, proudly displaying the school's name and motto. While they undoubtedly serve to protect our clothing underneath, and uh, they, they, they most probably uh, really served, their primary purpose most probably was to mask differences among us, uh, the slightly better off children and those of impoverished homes, although I must say we were probably all from very impoverished homes, are equalized behind the apron coats and their depersonalized whiteness. But what is most striking about my school images is the fact that hardly a person in them is smiling. Almost everyone looks solemn, serious, largely cheerless and unhappy. This, by, early 19, by the early 1940s, has nothing to do with photographic technology, with slow film or slow shutter speeds that in earlier decades have made it easier, actually, to take photos of serious faces than those of harder to hold still and, and sustain natural smiles. Early photos are all serious, if you, can, if you remember. Nor did it reflect an older, more formal portrait convention that encouraged dignified expressiveness over seemingly grinning frivolity. The cheerlessness in my photos may well have, been, have mirrored the general bleak atmosphere of the Kinderheim, uh, which I sort of remember as a joyless institution uh, whose staff seemed much more uh, concerned with establishing order and maintaining discipline than with our instruction or, or with our imaginative potential. And it would most definitely have reflected the general gloom and uncertainty that was pervading the, the, the times, the ongoing world war, and the repeatedly traumatic confirmations of the horrors that would later be called the Holocaust. The fact, of course, was that all of those 
in, all of us in these photos were either recent refugees or, like me, children of recent refugees born in the land that had granted our parents refuge. All the teachers, their assistants, even the older children in the group had emigrated from Europe only a few years earlier and had directly or indirectly experienced Nazi intimidation and persecution in their homelands uh, from which they were all displaced. On a daily basis, News about the war and the fate of relatives and loved ones that were left behind made its way to Bolivia and fueled our parents' conversations and apprehensions. There was indeed no way that our parents' fears and sorrows could be hidden from us. In our family, it was during the month that we lived in Miraflores, above the Kinderheim, that we received news of the, or confirmation of the killing of my father's half-sister, Gizzi, and about her husband, Leopold, and their younger daughter, Rosie, after they were transported from Vienna to Riga. The gloom in which we children were enveloped, pierced even as conventional a thing as a school photo. So people may want to know which little boy you are. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> There's a little boy uh, on the next. Do you see the teacher with the, with the dark glasses? Yeah. I'm next to her. Okay. In the background. In the background. In the last background. row. In the very last row. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Looks just like him, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, in case you want to know, do you recognize me in this photo? Middle of the front row, it's true. <laughs> so we're showing, I'm showing you this one to say that in, in many ways, um, even though Leo has just told you about the context, the very unusual and very particular context of the photos from the Kinderheim in La Paz, those photos conform in every way to photos snapped elsewhere. Of course, they were taken outdoors. This, was, this one was indoors in the classroom. And, Bucharest in the 1950s, but really um, the photos taken in happier times or less worrisome times are really not that different from the photos that you saw from the Bolivian Kinderheim. There's so much suggested in class photos for those who are attuned to the heterogeneous knowledges that they carry, uh, knowledges that are multisensory, that are cognitive and emotional. What we find in these photos is uh, a number of elements, the powerful social integrationist effects of schooling, the process of creating conformity and group identities, the feeling of childhood vulnerability and dependence, <coughs> the challenges of resistance and refusal. All those somehow are carried by these objects. We talked a little bit last time about what do they contain and what do we read into them. And I, don't, I think maybe that's not a, that helpful a terminology. They, they carry these knowledges, they convey them on many different levels and not just the visible because I think if we look at photographs only through vision, I think we're missing some other dimensions and that's a little bit what we want to develop today. Um, so there's also more. As broadly disseminated visual documents that are held in multiple and family and public archives School photos serve as confirming evidence of collective belonging <laughs> in a cohort of age ma mates over the course of schooling and beyond. And that's very clear in some photos of populations that later were persecuted or disappeared. You can't say that they didn't exist because photos are sent around and they become somehow evidence of existence and of a community. Um, that was gathered at least as one mo at one moment. So school photos or group photos can serve as testimonial obje objects that carry evidence of past existence and previous institutional life. So they can be um, effective mnemonic aids helping to identify particular classmates, especially in an aftermath that's disturbed by shifting political circumstances and the extremes of persecution of war and of genocide. 
They combat forgetting. They resist exclusion or er eradication of members from a group and of the group itself. And I think this is especially true of images that are taken at moments of political change, when on the one hand, as we see in this photograph, national identity um, and, and uh, belonging in identification is forcibly imposed and previous histories are erased, or conversely, when belonging is impaired uh, and or denied as some social groups within the body politic are singled out and redefined through prejudice, prejudice, exclusion, and eradication. And last time we talked a little bit about the artistic installations of Christian Boltanski, who used this um, photo from Vienna's, uh, from a Jewish school in Vienna's second district as part of his, in, taken in the 1930s, and then re, um, reframed it in these installations that showed what happened, what, or what might have happened to each of those children. He um, embeds them in a kind of after, aftermath Holocaust aesthetic. So if we read school photographs as a subset of a more encompassing genre of group portraits, and we thought of like, you know, how, what kind of artistic genre do they fit? Well, what about group portraits that existed way before photography? We, we can think of paintings and of photographs of guilds, of army units, of clubs, of unions, of youth groups, of camps, right? We can perhaps speculate more wildly on the kinds of contradictory resonances that they evoke. And doing this, we might see them in the terms that are introduced very usefully by the early 20th century art historian Abi Warburg in this remarkable book that he put together called the Mnemosyne Atlas. Mnemosyne is the, the muse of memory, right? And there, Warburg usefully mapped a set of what he called pre-established expressive forms that carry and transmit affect across time and that thereby constitute a kind of transgenerational memorial repertoire in visual form. So what are the pre-established expressive forms that get carried across generation? And we thought, well, maybe group portraits somehow are because we've seen group portraits, you know, the burgers of Calais, I mean, even in sculpture form, I mean, you see them throughout, throughout history. So in that sense, we might wonder what affects do school photos carry and transmit over time? What in the um, words of the terms of the art historian Jill Bennett is their emotional life? Um, so by, well, and there I am again, but that's in the second row on, the, on your right, second row from the bottom. So, you know, by bringing into focus, as you see here, the subordination of individuality to group membership and incorporation into a social and civic assemblage, um, school photos convey the desire on the one hand, but also on the other hand, the reluctance to belong to the group, especially if we think of the often violent and coercive eradication of individuality that can happen at some particular historical moments. But even in ordinary times, I'm sure all of us in this room have felt as part of a group identity somehow sometimes wanting to be part of it and sometimes really not wanting to be part of it. And we, what we want to argue is that these uh, images carry these contradictory feelings. So the ten this tension between assimilation to the group on the one hand and subversion, resistance, refusal on the other is a characteristic of the emotional life of class photos. So unlike portraits, which um, in Hans Georg Gadamer's terms produce what he calls an increase of being, a surplus that consolidates the uniqueness of the individual subject that, who, that, who's being depicted, class photo tends to negate that uniqueness and in that, that sense they become anti-portraits structured by the school's institutional gaze instead. But I would say that the aura of individual identities continues to haunt every group image as an excess that cannot be fully erased. And this is a wonderful image, I think, um, illustrating this. I don't know how many people have, here have read the wonderful graphic memoir by Marjan Satrapi, Persepolis, which begins with this image where she says, this is me when I was 10 years old. This was in 1980, and this is a, a class photo, but, but then she, she says, but you can't see me. So she's really the hidden child. So where am I, who's the I in this eradication of individuality that came 
with uh, the revolution in Iran. So inevitably, um, however, these affects shift over time in repeated encounters with images from the past. Our evolving relationship to school pictures and the heterogeneous knowledges that they carry testify to what we can think of as a kind of continued development of the images in what we might call liquid time. And this is a term that we're adapting from a wonderful, very short essay by the artist Jeffrey Wall, Jeff Wall, uh, Photography and Liquid Intelligence. So one could say that institutional images like school photos are taken to measure time dryly, from class year to ensuing class year, as it were, projecting normalcy and belonging into a certain future. So he says time is dry. It, the, 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 the aspect of photography that's dry is the apparatus of the image. But, but the liquid is the developing liquid, right? So before things get set, they're fluid. Before fixity takes in, they're fluid. And what we're saying is photographs keep developing as they're handed on from hand to hand, as they appear in web, on websites where people ask for more identification, as they get cracked in, uh, in shoe boxes, as they get reframed by artists. Um, there's a lot more that happens. So their trajectory can shift and change. Their meanings can evolve in incalculable and unforeseen ways. And since they're connected to the complexities and vulnerabilities of childhood and youth, we could say that school photos, as they keep developing, activate and reactivate memory and affect in shifting present circumstances. And this is especially true in the, I mean, I think artists who use school photos show us this in very interesting ways. So I, I, I just want to show you a few artists that we can't really talk about, but just to give you a sense of the artistic presence of school photos um, in contemporary artwork. So this is a work by Tomoko Sawada from Japan called School Days. And uh, it's her face in every single one of these um, uniforms, right? So, uh, you know, she's showing the conformity. And I mean, it's really a wonderful, very, um, very haunting image. Um, I'll just do this. Mm -hmm. um, this is a really powerful image by the Argentinian artist Marcelo Brodsky. Um, it's it's his, of his own school class from 1967. He, he then went into exile during the dictatorship. But when he came back, he reassembled the school class. and wrote um, the fate of some of these children onto the print that he had blown up, but then he crossed out the faces of the children who were disappeared by the state. It's a very powerful indictment of a state that, on the one hand, um, educates children and build, you know, integrates them into the body politic, and on the other hand, then um, also um, disappears and, and mur tortures and murders them. But um, in the process of disappearance, the idea of the in dictatorship is that these people will never have existed. But in an image like this one, you cannot argue that they didn't exist because many people owned this particular image. And uh, Brodsky has taken it upon himself to make a monument out of this particular work to install it in the school and, and so on. Very powerful. And this is also uh, Mirta Kupferming, an artist from Argentina, who does this homage to the Night of the Pencils, where a number of students were um, disappeared, and um, she does an installation with her own school image and then another childhood image of herself. Uh, in the frame that was used, Recuerdo Escolar, a school souvenir, that was used to send the school images home when she was a child. A uh, very similar kind of thing. I think we showed you last time the image of Stephen Dale, who um, uses one of the images from the Carlisle Indian School to reframe. Um, this really fascinating image, um, etching by Sandra Ramos, who's a Cuban, a Cuban artist, uh, who's showing us um, what communist education teaches or doesn't teach, um, ways in which the, the child or the children can resist or refuse, uh, turn away uh, from learning. Um, and then this also a, a, a painting by the South African artist Marlene Dumas, um, who um, it, which is called The Teacher. It's very hard to know exactly how to interpret this, but as you can see, it's a very multi-ethnic school class, which no doubt <coughs> during her childhood didn't exist. So perhaps she was fantasizing that this might have been the class she might have wanted to go to, 
in a very um, you know segregated apartheid um, classroom. Um, maybe that, or maybe other ways to interpret it. But I think all these images show us the liquidity of the the image and the many different interpretations you can show. School photos appear in fiction or in memoir. Uh, um, in Zebald's novel Austerlitz, there's not a, a class photo, but it's a football the football team, and he actually has a little arrow. And I mean, of course, it's a it's a novel, but uh, the character in the novel is part of this image. And Edward Said's Out of Place. This is his uh, school picture from the private school that he in Victoria College that he attended. And then this uh, I'll end with this one is a um, purely digitally constructed school picture by Ruud van Empel, a Dutch artist. So there's no analog for this. There's no model. He just uh, has a, a number of images like this that, that he's constructed. So really, um, in the, what we want to say is that invisibly, school pictures carry their own future with them in which they will be looked at, reevaluated, in which they will have new roles to play and new questions to answer in various vernacular and artistic settings. And we've shown you here just some of the artistic possibilities that they've offered in a very, very quick um, kind of um, summary. But we're moving on. So, of course, some children are not allowed to view their school photographs in a future time. And these images of school classes, of children in school taken in moments of extremity, pose very, very particular challenges. And we're going to spend some time with those. When I look nowadays at the Kinderheim photos that I just showed you with the other children that were taken in Bolivia, uh, I tend to think about them now in a kind of broader context. In relationship to schooling, and Jewish school-age children in Germany and uh, my parents, Austria, some years earlier, during the 1930s, during that growth of Nazism and virulent anti-Semitism, and also in relation to the experience of Jewish school-age children in Nazi-occupied Europe in the early 1940s, around the same years my photos were taken. If you look at my photos in this enlarged framework, I realize actually how incredibly fortunate we were to be safe and actually attending school despite the gloomy demeanor we projected. In my parents' Central Europe, soon after Hitler's accession to power, Jewish school children faced the rapid buildup of prejudice and discrimination, taunting insults, ridicule, bullying, and brutal physical treatment by their non-Jewish classmates and teachers. Starting with the April 1933 law against overcrowding of German schools and universities, which introduced the racial quota, uh, which limited the enrollment of Jewish pupils, until the November 1938 post-Kristallnacht decrees that finally expelled and banned all Jews from attending any state public schools in the German Reich, Jewish school enrollment was severely curtailed. Only privately supported Jewish schools and trade and vocational schools specifically intended to prepare young Jews for manual labor remained open. Institutions that uh, readied them for displacement and emigration that in effect, the, at that point, the Nazi policy until the Wannsee Conference and the Final Solution was to force people out, to have them emigrate. So here, these are actually from our, my family album. Uh, my father is among this group, really being trained during this period of time. The hope was for some of them that they would go to Israel or to Palestine at that time, others just to be trained in case something some other future still was open to them. Both my parents, who were teenagers in the 1930s, were really the victims of the shutting down of academic schooling possibilities. You know, instead of being able to become an engineer, in the case of my father, which was his dream, my father, uh, or my mother, whose dream was really to become a nurse at the time, uh, my mother apprenticed to become a millinery, 
and my father a plumber and an electrician, which is what he practiced in Bolivia. So tellingly, as you can see from some of these school images taken in Germany uh, and Austria during the 1930s, the genre of school photographs uh, was, were able to hide the growing anti-Semitic uh, harassment, segregation, uh, but at the same time, uh, it, the induced emig em emigration that was being uh, fervently practiced, uh, but not always, that, that, that was really in a sense. Here, this is, this is what it shows you, a school, and yet some of the children there raising their hands in the Hitler, uh, in the Hitler salute. The marginalization, the curtailment that Central European Jewish school children experienced, especially in the late 1930s, was only a prelude to the immense horror that overshadowed European Jewish children of all ages during the years of the Holocaust. As Nahama Tech indicates, in, and I quote her, uh, quote, in line with the Third Reich's racial policies, all Jewish children were slated for murder, unquote. And indeed, when the, the war ended, only 11% of Jewish children in Nazi-occupied Europe survived in comparison to 33% survival for adults. Given this extreme historical moment and the extermination that was taking place, it is indeed astounding that school pictures continue to be taken, developed, and saved. Family and public archives contain numerous school class photographs of Jewish children who, unlike me at the time, uh, who was born to refugee parents, spent the years of the Second World War in hiding, in ghettos, in transit camps, and even in concentration camps throughout Nazi-occupied Europe. In many cases, these images are the last traces that remain of children who were murdered. Like the Hampton, and the Carlisle pictures that we discussed last time, many of the surviving wartime images from Jewish ghettos were taken by perpetrators for propaganda purposes. Here's one of them. But some were taken by victims themselves, often at great risk, since educational policies varied for over time, ranging from control toleration to outright bans in different regions of Nazi rule. That schooling continued at all during the war years in Nazi-occupied Europe, in the occupied cities and towns and ghettos, and even in the concentration camps, uh, despite uh, even in areas of draconian interdiction, it may perhaps not be surprising. That is, the effort to educate children and to provide them with daily routine of schooling reflected an impulse to render a kind of sense of normality, of ordinariness to extraordinary times. Though that sense of normality had different valences for victims and perpetrators. On the part of the Nazis, allowing some Jewish children access or limited access to education enhanced the enormous lie on which the machinery of extermination rested. That ghettos and work camps were merely transit stations to relocation rather than to extermination. Vocational schools were the most readily sanctioned in Nazi ghettos, but in some places Nazis actually allowed the formation of elementary schools to free women to work uh, and perhaps to concentrate children in accessible locations. School pictures fulfilled many of the functions of Nazi photography more generally. They could serve as propaganda against Jews, uh, 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 propaganda against Jews, depicting what was made to appear as their subhuman degeneracy, in the same way that uh, some of the Native American pictures were made to appear as subhuman degeneracy. At this image, uh, uh, this, uh, as, as this image of, uh, that was taken in Nazi Germany, we don't know exactly when it was taken. Uh, and it appeared in the Nazi tabloid Der Sturmer, which is a vast, this is the, one of the really anti-Semitic uh, 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 Nazi uh, 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 newspapers. Uh, and the caption that, that it had under it was, Satan's blood. 
uh, brood. So here you have uh, Satan's, uh, Satan's brood. brood sorry, yeah. Satan's brood. But uh, the event of, photograph uh, of photography could also mask the path toward extermination on which victims found themselves. In the Lodge ghetto, for example, color photos, and this is a really amazing, at the time of the war, this is a color photo. It's, it's sort of faded here, but it's a, it was taken as a color photo of smiling school children were taken by a man called Walter Genewein, who was a German administrator and amateur photographer. And these were intended to project normalcy and the continuation of the continuity of, of, of Jewish existence the so-called benign quality of Nazi rule over Jews. Images of children taken by Nazi propaganda corps, there's a whole propaganda corps that was established by the Nazis to photograph, uh, or by official Nazi photographers uh, from Jewish councils, or uh, Nazi sanctioned photographers from Jewish councils, so for example, in places like Warsaw, or Lodz, or Terezin, perpetuated these lies uh, by means of their blatant staging. So a lot of these photographs that they took, the Nazi propaganda people, were staged. When we view these images, we need to remember and be aware that photography was an integral part, really, of the Nazi killing machine. <coughs> Such perpetrator images, as we've, ar uh, we've argued, are ruled by what we call the Nazi gaze, one that deeply shatters the visual field and reorients the basic structures of, phot of, of photographic looking. Facing a Nazi photographer, the subject of such an image does not elicit what we call, or what we talked about last time, a civil gaze. He or she can do no more than display how civil viewing relations are broken by the genocidal intention of the killing machine of which the image is a part. The look of the perpetrator or his agents circumscribes all perpetrator images. In effect, facing a Nazi ph a photographer, the subject is shot before being shot. The especially telling case of the Lodge ghetto does, however, complicate this argument about the lethal singularity of the Nazi gaze, opening what Primo Levi has termed the kind of gray zone. Before being dissolved, the Lodge ghetto had extensive schooling with some 14,000 pupils in 715 educational establishment. For the most part, these were na Nazi sanctioned, and they were promoted by the controversial head of the Jewish council, Chaim Rumkowski. Rumkowski, who was known for his love of children, posed on numerous occasions with what he called orderly school children in their orderly classrooms. If Rumkowski used his core of Nazi-permitted Jewish photographers who seem not to have been deprived of film and developing material, that's of course one of the, one of the key resources during that war period, film, developing material, where do you get it? Where do you get a camera? Uh, how, do you, how do you handle this? You know, we, don't, we don't think about the possibilities of, 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 taking, uh, of, of taking photographs during this time. Uh, they had it, and obviously they were sanctioned to some extent, and that's, that's the reason they had it. Uh, and he wanted to show, in a sense, how well run and civilized the ghetto was. Uh, and when he did this, it was not only to show off his own leadership uh, qualities, uh, and he very often was called, uh, behind his back, the king of the Jews. But it was also con to convince Nazi authorities of the continued necessity of, uh, and the worthiness of the Jews in, in, the, in, the, in the Lodge ghetto. So you know, the question that he probably sort of asked himself is, how could such clean and educated children be deported and killed? Uh, the images that were, that were taken seem to, uh, seem to ask the, the, this question. How could such, such children be deported and gay? It seemed inconceivable. Yet, of course, famously, uh, Rimkowski, uh, famously and tragically, in September 1942, Rimkowski agreed to bargain for the lives of his subjects by handing uh, uh, old people and some of these very uh, uh, school children that, that were photographed over to the Nazis for deportation, hoping in exchange to be allowed to save some of the remaining 
ghetto inhabitants. This is a choiceless choice, if you like. It may not seem astonishing, indeed, that pictures of school children continue to be taken by less privileged victims as well, snapped despite severe wartime interdictions against personal and private photography, despite the dire scarcity of film and developing materials, and the mortal dangers that anyone practicing uh, uh, clandestinely or, or ac resistance activities, the danger that everyone faced uh, in, that, in such a case. Such clandestine photos taken by Jewish photographers at, at the incredible risk to themselves were meant to ensure that a record of a population targeted for destruction be made and left behind for possible viewing at a future time. So this was already a kind of desire to leave some kind of record behind. And that's, that's, you like, that was one of the driving forces behind it. For photographers like George Kaddish in Kovno and Mendel Grossman in Lodge, as well as unnamed ones who belong to uh, communist and other underground organizations, often photographed clandestinely through, sometimes through, through, through cracks in doors, or sometimes through, through uh, uh, buttonholes of their coats as they were outdoors. It was amazing some of the photographs that are taken, for example, by Mendel Groschman and Lodge. I don't know if any of you have ever seen the album of, of these photos. They're, 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 they're amazing. Uh, and uh, they buried and hid their negatives uh, to ensure the survival of, 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 of these photos. The amazing bravery that was required uh, to take such school pictures in clandestine schools, in places like the post-1942 Warsaw Ghetto and the Mielik or the Kovno or the Bedzin ghettos where children in schooling were, were unequivocally banned that it's, it's impressive, it's, it's, it's mind-boggling, really, the, 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 the bravery that it took. And it was in these uh, clandestine schools that some of the most moving acts of solidarity and resistance indeed <coughs> took place. And Korn, who was a teacher in an underground school in Lublin, uh, which was held in a, the, the, the school was held in a, in, a, in a ghetto shop, noted, and I quote her, uh, with beating hearts, we conducted, some, we conducted lessons simultaneously on the alert for the barking voice of the SS who frequently raided Jewish homes. And Mary Berg, who was a Warsaw Ghetto teacher, wrote in her diary, and I quote, there are now a great number of illegal schools and they're multiplying every day. People are studying in attics and cellars and every subject is included in the curriculum, even Latin and Greek. There are no bad pupils. The illegal character of the teaching, the dangers to threaten us every minute, fills us all with a strange earnestness. At the very same time that children were dying of starvation by the thousands in the ghetto, in the Warsaw Ghetto, Paula Rutschild observed that the children studying with her, and I quote her, forgot about the whole world, even about the fact that they were a bit hungry maybe more than a bit. These lessons were our happiness, our oblivion. If we take the ideological and the memorial work of school photos into account, as well as the life-affirming role of that schooling came to play in moments of helplessness and despair, and the length to which adults went to ensure that children could learn in such dire circumstances, Photographs taken of ghetto schools came to appear more intelligible. Even a fo photo like this one, which is <laughs> kind of boggles the mind, uh, this is an image of several girls celebrating their, their, uh, their uh, end of year, their final exams, by sunbathing and being photographed. This is in the Warsaw Ghetto. It's an amazing <laughs> photograph. Although improbably, schools were formed even in transit and concentration camps, uh, but here the Therizine family camp in Birkenau is, a, is an example of, of, of such a school. Uh, Therizine camp uh, was, was Theresienstadt, 
the, the uh, uh, family groups were brought to, to Birkenau, and they were kept in Birkenau for many, many months as, as a family group, as quite opposed from what the other uh, prisoners in Birkenau suffered. And then finally, they were, uh, or most of them anyway, were also uh, uh, killed in, uh, by gassing. Uh, they, they left important testimonies by students and teachers in the, in the, from the family camp. There was one oasis in our camp, one road, a place in which one could forget the present, in which one was still a human being. And that was written by, Mona, uh, by Hannah Hoffman Fischel. Uh, and she, was, uh, she, she spent some time as, as a teacher in that Terezin family camp in Birkenau. And she wrote, that was the children's home, the Kinderheim, an undertaking of Freddie Hirsch. Freddie Hirsch was the teacher who was brought over from, from Terezin, and he became the head of this, of this uh, family camp. Uh, if you've ever seen Shoah, there's a big scene of Freddie Hirsch. And Freddie Hirsch, when the children were finally deported, well, before they were deported, he committed suicide. And it was, that was really the, the down, the, the end of that family camp. Each day, there were five hours of lessons. The classroom lessons took place under difficult conditions. Few of us were trained as teachers. Nevertheless, we attempted to teach the children. Many of them had not yet had any schooling, the fundamental basics. In contrast to this short live uh, school in Birkenau, which was negotiated with SS authorities by Hirsch for at least a few months, the makeshift school in Bergen-Belsen was utterly clandestine. A teacher, Hannah Levy Haas, uh, I don't know if any of you ever read Amira Haas, who's a journalist uh, for Haaretz, uh, this is her mother, Hannah Levy Haas, describes the formation of that school in her camp diary, and I quote it, we did it at times when the Germans were unable to come. Teachers and children made radical sacrifices to continue schooling. It was not easy to write with any kind of book, she continued, and I have to write subjects down on dozens and dozens of little pieces of paper. They get pencils and paper in whatever way they can, selling their bread ration or doing some other kind of deal or simply stealing from each other. I distinctly feel that our school has become indispensable and, that's the only, uh, and that it is the only way to revive and maintain any freshmen, freshness in their souls. The vast majority of children evince a strong desire to study, to make up for lost time. It is with cries of joy and hooray that they, become, that they welcome my calls to gather together. The most resourceful among them then fight to get a free corner in the barracks where we can have a class. They all settle in and I see adorable children's faces around me on which I read both cheerfulness and concentration. Now the practice of educating children against all interdiction and to continue the taking of pictures underscores these bold acts of defiance and resistance that were involved in setting up in clandestine schools and the courage it took to shelter Jewish children in hiding. Now in photographing the children and the educators and photographers were also recording their own courage and will to survive. As radical as, as war and Nazi genocidal practices were in, in, in capturing the textures of social life in Nazi-occupied Europe, so were victim and bystanders determined to restitch some of the qualities of life through small acts of repair. Here we have, oh, just before that, you saw a picture of, of children in hiding, actually, uh, in, uh, in the, being hidden, in, in, hidden in a Catholic school. In response to utter dehumanization, photographers could try to rehumanize Jews by showing children reading and learning uh, whether acquiring traditional religious instruction, engaged in secular learning, or the interrupted path to, to cosmopolitan modernity that so many European Jews, of course, had, uh, had desired in the 20th century. Uh, but they also have, uh, there's 
this amazing photograph of the Warsaw Ghetto that shows, in a sense, a, a kind of resistance already in the photograph. It's this child being pointing to Palestine at the time, obviously a Zionist response, no longer wanting the old uh, assimilationism, the old uh, uh, cosmopolitanism that had been promised Jews in the 19th century. It is now that promise seems to be a, a false promise of one that, 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 that failed. So the only, the next promise is really Palestine as far as this photo was concerned in the Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, Jewish leaders came to see education of any form uh, needed to be uh, to the preparation for resistance supporters by a, a large organization movement. They, they, they came to actually favor this kind of resistance. So uh, in the Warsaw Ghetto, uh, uh, Yitzhak Zuckerman, who was one of the leaders of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, asserted, and I quote, all the education work which aspired to preserve the humanity of the younger generation and arouse the spirit of battle within it would have been meaningless unless together with it and by virtue of its power an armed Jewish resistance force came into being. So he was seeing this as a way to organize uh, some, some resistance. So we want to switch gears a little bit and spend the last time part of the talk on a particular set of photographs, uh, which is probably much better known than the ones that we've been showing you so far. And that's the photographs of the hidden children, hidden Jewish children in Isieux, France. Um, and they, they may be the best known uh, pictures of Jewish children during the war. Paradoxically, these children were photographed even as they tried to elude the lethal gaze that positioned them as undesirable and dispensable fodder for the Nazi killing machine. Their pictures were taken at a moment when collaborationist Vichy officials had expelled Jews from schooling and when the parents of many of these children had already been arrested, deported, or gone into hiding in different locations. So if the teachers and neighbors who took their photographs exposed these vulnerable subjects to the endangerment of the camera's gaze, it must have been some out of some of the same motives that we uh, spinned out um, in um, the, what we uh, talked about previously in relation to the ghetto um, schools and, this, and the camp, camp schools. But in liquid time, these easier images acquire additional memorial, legal, and artistic afterlives as well. The children's homes and schools that worked to rescue Jewish children in France throughout the years of the occupation and to continue educating them, ironically, in a French curriculum, had in fact been founded long before the Second World War by a charitable organization, the Oeuvre de Secours aux Enfants, the OSE. By 1943, these institutions were potentially easy targets for the Nazi and Vichy government, uh, for Nazi and Vichy government persecution. And the OSO, this organization, feared exposure of the identity of the Jewish children in, in boarding schools set up to hide them or to rescue them. So they considered shutting them down. But they didn't know what they might do, what they would do with these children who had already been separated from their parents if they did so. So instead, what they chose to do was to try to pass off the schools as Christian boarding schools and to disguise them administratively so that they would not appear to be any longer um, under the control of this OSO um, organization. And meanwhile, they tried to find temporary homes for the children with Christian families. And also their hope was then to help the children escape um, out, out of occupied French territory altogether. But there was something special about Isieux um, as opposed to some of the other schools. It's a very remote, hilly town. It was somehow under the protection of the subprefecture of the nearby town, Belay, where some of the officials seemed to know about the school and somehow condone it or protect it. And there was also a particular hospitality of the local population that somehow must have led the teachers to believe that this school wa would be immune um, from arrests and raids, uh, even as they were finding out about arrests and raids in neighboring towns in other institutions in the region. 
So for that reason, the lethal raid by the Gestapo on April 6, 1944, in which 44 children from the Izio school and their teachers were seized and deported to Drancy, to the transit camp at Drancy, and then to Auschwitz, uh, somehow were naively unexpected by the teachers. And of course, all those children and their teachers were gassed in Auschwitz. Um, almost all but one of the photos of these children that had been made in the previous two years were made by, were taken by a non-Jewish assistant teacher, Paulette Payares, who had brought her camera to the school during the summer of 1943. She wasn't a great photographer. She was not an official school photographer, <coughs> but somehow uh, she left the only record that's left of those children. The, the, there's only one of the you know, 15 or so photos that survived that was taken by a neighbor. She took all of the others. And so she left a poignant and rare record of nearly all of the 44 children who were picked up um, in the raid and murdered in Auschwitz. And yet when we see the best known of these images, somehow this radical contextual difference of the situation in Izio is not quite visible to it, in it because this photo seems to conform much more to the genre. Um, it's the children smile, they face forward, they're looking intently at someone standing to the left of the camera. The danger to which they're a subject, the efforts of the townspeople and the international agencies that were hiding them, the worries they might have had about their parents and their own future, all these seem to remain outside of the frame of this really quite conventional image. In the picture itself, these children seem happy. They seem closely knit as a group. Um, the moment seems ordinary. Somehow the conventionality of the image disguises and renders invisible the extraordinary circumstances in which this picture and others from the same school are snapped. So the reason this picture became famous was that it was widely circulated in 1987 during the trial of Klaus Barbie that some of you may know about or remember because it was Klaus Barbie, Barbie who was the Gestapo chief in Lyon who was responsible for the raid. And in fact, uh, since the statute of limitation on war crimes had already run out, Barbie had to be tried for crimes against humanity and it was, and you know, he had many crimes as you can imagine as Gestapo chief in Lyon, but it was, this was one of the prime uh, matters of evidence that was used against him because um, in deporting these, um, because um, in fact, uh, one child was saved from the raid and it was the only non-Jewish child in the school. So that proved that the crime was a racial crime and not a war crime. Um, and so um, it, this was what made him chargeable with crimes against humanity. But interestingly, in order for this, this photograph to function as such an effective evidentiary and memorial medium for such a crime, the original image had to be cropped. And this is the image that that was cropped out of. And the, you know, the uh, cropped image was uh, on the cover of the New York Times Magazine during the Barbie trial. But this image is really a quite a different image and might not have played that same role had it been uh, used. So the, the crop, what the cropping did is unify a very disparate and quite incongruous image. You see these are children of many different ages. They're all look, looking in different directions. Um, there's, some are sitting on the floor. They're squinting into the sun. Um, obviously, this is not a school photo of the conventional kind. Um, and, um, you know, some of the children are thumbing their noses. It's quite uncharacteristic. So what happens in this larger image is that it opens up a multiplicity of looks and gestures and affects that point to heterogeneous and contradictory um, elements that the cropped photo uh, has, um, has um, somehow unified. Other is of these year photos that um, we showed you earlier that Paulette Payares took are also very unconventional. They're informal groupings. They're poorly lit. They're poorly set up. They're random snapshots of an amateur who seems not to be in a position of authority over the children. And that actually connects uh, the Izio pictures to some of the ghetto images that also were 
obviously poorly lit, that were not taken from the front, that were um, clandestine images, and, I, and, and this somehow um, connects these images and shows us um, what their, uh, becomes a key to their provenance. But really, in any of these images, the looks traversing the camera gaze can only begin to suggest the differences among these children who are most likely from very different backgrounds, who probably speak different languages, and to, who no doubt have different relationships to the dangers that surround them. So we, we might wonder about the uniform smiles that we see in the cropped image, and um, we might um, wonder whether and, and even in this one, whether the ideologically unifying medium of the school picture or the camp photograph that this actually looks more like, um, whether this medium would have unified the children in some ways, somehow encouraging them or coercing these kinds of expressions on the faces of these boys and girls who were being saved. But we might wonder, what in such circumstances does it mean to save a child? What is the relationship of the image to the liquid temporality of its own future? And we see here um, uh, it, the school in these years is now a small museum, and there are many really moving artifacts. So here's a letter of a little boy to his father. Most likely his father was probably no longer alive when he wrote this letter. And here we have not just the image, but really the signature, the handwriting of this child who was not allowed to survive. So unlike Leo, the children of Isieu, um were not able to look at their school photos as adults. Uh, they didn't live to look back at the image from a later vantage point. Their life was cut short. In the New York, um, it's New York Times Magazine reproduct, cover reproduction uh, in relation to this article about the Barbie trial prompted the artist Lori Novak to uh, use it as the basis of a projection, uh, multi-layered projection, in a work that she called Past Lives for the Children of Isieux in 1987. So Past Lives, her title, signals retrospection and evolution, the inscription of this school photo into a public memorial and historical context. Novak's projection and superimposition restores to the image some of the messiness and multivalence that we saw in the uncropped picture, but of course she uses the cropped image because that's the only one that was available, that was the one that was available to her in the New York Times Magazine. So what she did is to, uh, through a multiple uh, technique of multiple projections that are then re-photographed, she can proliferate the perspectives and temporalities of the photographic image and its heterogeneous knowledge, extending it in space and in time and taking a measure of its afterlife, actually giving it an afterlife. So what Novak does is to mark the moment of the Barbie trial through a personal, effective, and artistic act of engagement. She projected the New York Times image onto the wall of a room, and she superimposed it on two other images. I think you can see the picture of Novak as a small child held by her mother, and then um, to your right, you see a large face with eyes, it, this is a, a, a very famous photograph of Ethel Rosenberg that was taken, um, you know, obviously before the execution. So what does past lives do? It connects um, the group picture to two individual images, one of a mother and child, the other of the mother and public figure who was executed by the state. So with the corner wall, as you see, she projected all these onto a wall, and the straight lines that enclose the figures like a photographic frame, and the cropped frame in particular, the children's faces um, exceed the limits of these lines, and thus past lives enact, enacts the tensions and paradoxes that are already present in the multiple images from wartime is year. Gone, is the apparent freedom of the outdoor assemblage that we saw in Isieu. She's trapped them in a room. She's enclosed them somehow in her own nightmare. So this is the story of an American, young American photographer, uh, an American child growing up in the 1950s. What are her nightmares, a Jewish child growing up in the United States in the 1950s? Her nightmares are that her mother will not be able to protect her, that she will be 
somehow exposed like these other children. And I think this image acts out those nightmares. But more recently, Novak reworked this image into yet another one using the children of Izio. It's a work that she named Post Memory, and she, um, I used this image in, on the cover of my, my book on Post Memory. So here she brings the children back outdoors. You probably don't even see them because they're hovering, and there's some faces hovering in the trees, and those are the faces of the children of Izio. She brings them uh, um, back outdoors, and she allows them to float eerily in a luminous forest setting. But now the original image is utterly disaggregated and no longer recognizable. Faces float separately as though they had escaped from the photo album that incongruously is held by two hands that hover over the forest floors. The album that Novak shows us is a family album open to a page that has a mother, father, and child, a family unit on one hand, on one side, a single woman standing be, uh, in front of an open door that points to a dark domestic in interior that's invisible to our eyes. The faces hover out of and above the family album. They're no longer affixed by photo corners as the two main images are. Somehow, all these different images coexist with one another, but they refuse to cohere in the same space or on the same plane. The faces blend into the natural background instead. So when the Izio image circulated during the Barbie trial and appeared on the cover of the Ma New York Times Magazine 43 years after the genocidal murder of its subject, it served as evidence of a, their past existence. It helped to indi indict Barbie for their murder, and it aided in their memorialization. But Novak's projections and installations enable us to see and to feel more than the indexical and documentary power of the photos on which they're based. They bring out some of the contradictory forms of knowledge that are carried by the original images themselves. I think the mixture of hope and hopelessness, the choiceless choices of parents and of teachers, the combination of protection and exposure hidden children faced in wartime Europe. So in that sense, in this image in post-memory, the sense of commonality and integration that school pictures perform is utterly gone. And gone as well as the sense of a future to be shared, the lies and deceptions that lured Holocaust victims into holding on to education and modernity as a lifeline. These your children are known individually. Their fate can be traced. Their destruction can be documented. We have each of their stories memorialized in the Izio Museum. But the faces in Novak's projection have lost these historical connections, and they can therefore stand in for countless nameless and anonymous victims who could not be saved by going to school. They remind us of the many anonymous faces floating in the school pictures that survive in public and private archives throughout the world, hard to find, waiting to be identified, documented, adopted, replaced into history and memory. Novak undertook such an act of adoption in her artwork, but she takes the children's faces out of history, projects them into a present that can no longer repair the losses of the past. So like Christian Boltanski, whom we spoke about a little bit last time, Novak disaggregates the images and disconnects the children's faces from each other, and thus, we see school pictures that are no longer group photos. They're just individually atomized images. And in that sense, they, they mark the dissolution of the group and recall the division and isolation that times of extremity can impose on group members who are forcibly separated from each other. And thus, artists like Novak and Boltansky can level powerful accusation against regimes that would expose children to persecution rather than protection States that would, on the one hand, appear to incorporate children into nationality and citizenship through schooling and ideological inculcation, but that, on the other hand, would target a group among them for deportation and for murder. In her post memory, the ghosts of past lives, school children, teachers, individuals, and family groupings have become part of the present landscape. Hovering over the greenery, they're intruders in the domestic as well as the natural and public spaces of the post-generations. They may gesture back to the past, remind us of its presence in our lives, but they don't signal any form of continuity with it, nor do they illuminate it. 
The past remains opaque, distant, yet also part of the very material textures of our surroundings. The dense, dense woods over which the faces float continue to replenish in the bright sunshine. They don't care, they keep growing. The trees persist in reaching upward, indifferent witnesses to the layered histories that are projected onto them, but that somehow will never be integrated with them. As the faces blow, float up out of the archive, um, disappearing back into the trees that were the very sources of the album into which the um, images were affixed. So if we think of the album being made out of trees, that album disappears back into the trees. The paper becomes tree again, in a sense. So I think that what we can see here, or what we, how we might interpret this, is to see perhaps the entire process of assimilation figured as a process of disappearance. So then we might wonder, what are we to do with all of this in the aftermath? How can we respond to the multiple demands of images such as this one, multiple demands that, however, I think remain unreadable to us? And I think that's part of what this image is showing us. So thank you.